Okay, guys, um, I'm going to be in this video recording the first half of the muscular tissue lecture, what we would have been doing had we been in class today. Um, I've already got the second half um, recorded and posted, so this is just over the first you know, five or so slides. Um, so I will turn my video off so I can share my screen. Talk about muscular tissue. Now, thinking back to our very first unit of the semester, we learned that muscle tissue is one of the four primary types of tissue in the body. Um, we learned that um, there's three types of muscle tissue, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Um, there's cardiac smooth glands. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle. Sorry, I'm used to talking in uh, physiology about cardiac smooth and glands together. Um, but cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle are the three types of muscle. Um, and together, those three types of muscle um, contribute to homeostasis through sustained contraction or by alternating contractions and relaxation. And when we talk about muscle, especially in this unit, the, the main type we're gonna be talking about is our skeletal muscle. Um, we just got done talking about the skeleton. Um, so we're moving on to um, what's attached to our skeleton um, to allow us to move and to stabilize body positions, which you can see are two of our four key functions of muscle tissue. These first two functions really just relate specifically to skeletal muscle. Uh, body movements like walking, running have absolutely nothing to do with smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. Same thing for stabilizing body positions um, to like help maintain the erect or seated posture against the force of gravity, um, which involves stabilizing joints like muscles in our neck that help keep our head upright. Okay. The third function there, moving substances within the body, actually does relate to the other two type, cardiac and smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle in our heart helps us pump blood. Um, smooth muscle in places like our digestive tract helps move um, the food that we're digesting through sperm and eggs move our oocytes through the reproductive system passages, urine through the urinary system, lymph through the lymphatic systems. Uh, I could go through and list off a lot more of things moving inside of us thanks to smooth muscle. Um, the fourth function there, generating heat, relates back again most, mostly to skeletal muscle, although when cardiac muscle and smooth muscle contract, they do generate heat. But we just have so much more cardiac, or excuse me, skeletal muscle that um, it really relates more to our skeletal muscle. Um, the ability to contract our muscles uh, produces heat, a property called thermogenesis. And the term thermogenesis actually means heat producing because thermo means heat, genesis means to form or create. Um, we take advantage of that by shivering when we're cold to increase our heat production. Um, although bones provide leverage and form the framework of our body, they cannot move body parts by themselves. Um, our motion results from alternating contraction and relaxation of muscles. I should say here, skeletal muscles that make up 40 to 50% of total adult body weight. Um, your muscular strength reflects the primary function of muscle. And this relates to all three types, transforming mechanical energy into mechanical energy, which enables us to generate force, perform work, and produce movements. Now on the next slide, we're gonna talk about the three types of muscle. Once again, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth how they are similar, but also how they're different with regard to various properties, how they look under a microscope, which we've actually done before, where they're located, and how they're controlled by our nervous and endocrine systems. Um, regardless which type we're talking about, whether it's cardiac, smooth, or skeletal, um, they all share these four similar special properties that enable them to function and contribute to homeostasis. The first property is a property that our neurons actually exhibit as well, called this excitability, which is the ability to respond to stimuli by producing electrical signals known as action potentials, or we could say nerve impulses instead of action potentials. Um, there's two types of stimuli that um, signal and action potential in our muscle tissues. Um, in our heart, we have what we call autorhythmic signals, um, um, specifically what we call the pacemaker of our heart. Um, generates its own action potentials. So that's why we're saying in the muscle tissue itself. Auto actually means self. So um, it's where it's a self-created action potential. Um, we have a natural pacemaker. You may have heard of people having a pacemaker put in, which is 
to kind of supplement or to replace the electrical um, structure known as your pacemaker. Um, when we talk about skeletal muscles, we're going to not use autorhythmic signals. Instead, we use chemical stimuli, things like neurotransmitters that are released by neurons, hormones distributed by the blood, or even just local changes in pH. Now, something that happens to a muscle when it becomes excited is that it contracts. And literally the word contract is in contractility, which is um, fancily described as the ability to contract force when stimulated, or contract forcefully when stimulated. When a muscle contracts, it generates tension while pulling on its attachment points. If this tension is enough to overcome the resistance of the object to be moved, the muscle shortens and movement occurs. Uh, that's all physics-based stuff. Um, I won't really get into it any more than that. The next two properties are properties that we actually talked about back when we talked about the skin. Our skin has both of these properties. Um, and if you think back to when we talked about how like the skin and other structures in our body are kind of like a rubber band, they have the ability to stretch or extend, which I like to say, because extend is you know kind of the word that's in extensibility, ability to stretch without being damaged. Now, once again, this is properties shared by all three types of muscles. So we see here stretching the heart when it fills with blood, stretching the stomach when it fills with food, or you know, like stretching your quads and your arm muscles and that kind of stuff before you go for a walk or you know, play a sport. Now, like a rubber band, you can stretch it, but only, you know, a certain amount before it would be damaged. So that's why um, I want to really point out that, uh, you know, without being damaged really is kind of misleading there because muscles obviously can be damaged. But the way that we're structured really, you know, for the most part, we don't see too, too drastic changes and damages occurring most of the time anyway. Uh, also like a rubber band, when you stretch it and you let go, it snaps back. Okay. We call this recoil or elasticity, uh, which is the ability of muscle tissue to return to its original length and shape, either after being contracted or shortened and um, or extended extension. Okay. Now, let's talk about the three types of muscle, starting with skeletal. Uh, we've seen these three pictures before. These are the exact same pictures that were in our tissues lecture. And some of this information was discussed at that point. I said we'd talk about them you know, this stuff again, here is that time. Um, skeletal muscle, once again, is named because it's um, typically what's attached to our skeleton to help move our bones. Um, a key feature that you see in skeletal muscle is that it is striated. You look hard enough in this illustration, it's not actually, I shouldn't call it an illustration, it's a picture, picture of uh, muscle tissue um, zoomed in 400 times. You see it kind of looks blurry because of what we call striations, light, dark, light, dark, uh, all the way across bands. Um, striations are a fancy way to describe these bands that you see when you look at skeletal muscle under a microscope. Um, key features of skeletal muscle, it works mainly in a voluntary manner, which means that we, you know, consciously, purposely control it. You know, like, you know, when you're writing your notes as you're you know, filling stuff in on, on this packet, you know, you're purposely, mentally, consciously doing that. Um, it's not just being done for you, like, you know, when your heart beats, for example. Now, we have a lot of muscles that are uh, more so controlled subconsciously, and we really don't even have to think about their um, actions. They're just being done for us. Like a lot of the muscle, muscles that run up our spine and our neck for posture. Um, we also have skeletal muscles like the diaphragm um, that are under subconscious control, but we can actually kind of override them and take conscious control over it. Diaphragm, we've mentioned before, is a muscle that separates the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities, and that's why we talked about it before. But more importantly, this is the skeletal muscle that allows us to breathe in and out, which you know, we don't really think about until we want to stop breathing, which sounds kind of weird. Uh, but um, holding our breath is actually a very important thing that we do when we you know, like take a shower or jump in a pool or something like that. Um, as I said earlier, skeletal, uh, skeletal muscles, called skeletal muscle because typically it's attached to our bone, but we also see in places it's attached to skin, fascia, as well as other muscles. Um, skeletal muscle is multinucleated. We'll talk about why that is here later in the lecture. Uh, but multinucleated means that it has multiple nuclei per cell. If you look hard enough in this picture, you can kind of see this flattened disc shaped structure. That would be one nucleus. There'd probably be another one there. You can see a couple dark. Um, oval shapes there and there. 
there's a bunch of nuclei per cell and the nuclei are pressed up against the cell membrane. Uh, the division of the nervous system that regulates our skeletal muscle is called the somatic nervous system, which is uh, something that we'll talk about here in a couple weeks. Picture below is an uh, almost an illustration of picture of cardiac muscle zoomed in. Uh, cardiac muscle is only found in the walls of the heart, specifically in what we call the myocardium. Uh, features of it, it is also striated. The striations are a little bit harder to see in this picture, but I promise you that they are there. Um, so we will see those dark light bands um, repeatedly. Um, and we'll talk about why that is here later in the lecture. One feature that you see in cardiac muscle that you do not find in the other two types of muscle is these thickened plasma membrane bands, which are called intercalated discs. And, and we'll talk about what those are later on the semester when we talk about the heart. Uh, other features, uh, there's a singular nucleus, so these are uninucleated. The nucleus is not pressed up against the side, it's in the middle, it's embedded within the muscle fiber. Uh, the action of cardiac muscle is completely involuntary. We have no conscious awareness, we cannot control it with our own free will and purpose. You know, we can do things like doing jumping jacks and running around that are gonna alter how often our heart beats and um, how strong our heart beats, but we can't just mentally say, okay, beat faster, beat slower. Um, once again, we have within the heart itself a pacemaker, um, and this is the structure that initiates the initial contraction relaxation of each heartbeat. Um, and this ability of the heart to initiate its own contraction is termed autoimmicity. Um, if we left our heart alone, our pacemaker would set a constant heart rate, I think it's like 100 beats per minute, um, and it would never change. But our heart um, beat you know, can speed up and slow down depending on the state of the body. Rarely um, is it gonna stay you know, right at a, a fixed number. Um, that's because there are hormones like epinephrine or adrenaline um, and neurotransmitters from what we call the autonomic nervous system that can tell that pacemaker to fire more often or fire less, which thus causes um, a change in heart rate. Okay. Now the autonomic nervous system is the division that regulates not only the cardiac muscle that I just talked about, but as you see, bottom it also is what regulates our smooth muscle smooth muscle is called smooth because it's non striated as you can see in the picture as it's labeled there we find it in our walls of hollow internal structures like blood vessels airways many organs you know you could go through and list a bunch uh, stomach the intestines uh, gallbladder the um, uterus in women the fallopian tubes the ureters, the bladder, I mean, I can go on for quite a while. Um, smooth muscle, as I said, is lax, it's gonna lack striations that we see in the skeletal and cardiac muscle. Um, it's uninucleated like um, cardiac muscle is. The nucleus in this is kind of just, I don't know, we're zoomed in just about the same, I guess 500, 500. Um, just looks like it's a lot bigger for whatever reason in, in smooth muscle than it is in um, cardiac muscle, I don't know if that's an actual thing or just kind of a, an optical illusion, but you know, if you were to have to, if you were have to, uh, you know, label these on the exam, that would be an easy thing to, to look for, the big nucleus in our cells of um, smooth muscle. Um, usually they, smooth muscle that is, are involuntary, meaning we can't control it. A uh, key feature of them is that they're slow moving, but more importantly, they're fatigue resistant. And it's kind of hard for them to tire out, which is good. That way they can keep trucking along, and, you know, pushing food along and digesting it, and moving you know, stuff around our body without you know, getting tired like our skin muscle is really well known for. Okay, and really at this point, what we're going to do is transition from talking about all three to just talking about skeletal muscle. Uh, we'll do that all the way through to the very last lecture slide in this um, lecture where we actually jump back and talk about cardiac and speed again. But for the time being, it's going to be all about um, skeletal muscle. Or excuse me, yeah, skeletal muscle. Um, what I'll do, I'll give you guys a couple seconds here. I know you need to fill this in, so I'll let you fill in. Sorry, I forgot to do that in the last couple slides. Guess you could just pause it, but that's okay.
Okay. Let's read through. Our subcutaneous layer is um, a portion of our body that we've talked about before. If we think back to when we talked about um, the skin, we talked about the subcutaneous layer. It's the layer that's just beneath our skin and is the layer that actually separates our muscle from our skin. We discussed that it was made up of areolar connected tissue and adipose tissue. It is also home to a type of connected tissue we call fa uh, fascia, or fascia I've heard it pronounced. Uh, is a fibrous, de dense, irregular connected tissue that covers our entire muscles, as well as found lining our body walls and limbs. Um, what it does is allows free movement of muscles, of muscles, supports nerves, blood vessels, and fat vessels, and fills the spaces between our muscles. Um, there are three layers of connected tissue that extend from the deep fascia that are found in, in our subcutaneous layer, and they help to protect and strengthen our skeletal muscle. We have what's called the epi, the peri, and the endomycium. The epimycium is a connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle. And what we have pictured here is just a cut um, along a transverse plane of a muscle, um, which happens to be the brachioradialis muscle. Uh, here we can see the tendon, the structure that connects that muscle to the bone, periosteum specifically, which we have recently just talked about. And here's our entire muscle that's been cut away. We see there's a membrane surrounding it called an epimycium. Okay. The epimycium is a overcoat of dense irregular connective tissue that surrounds the whole muscle fiber, or whole muscle, excuse me. Uh, just deep to it is another layer of connective tissue called a perimycium. This is a thicker, I should say layer, not lay, thicker layer of dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, this sheath wraps around muscle fibers or cells and creates um, or together in bundles called fascicles. So it doesn't wrap around the fibers, it, wrap around, it wraps around what we call fascicles, which are usually groups of 10 to 100 muscle fibers. Now, uh, look at this illustration, shows that um, there's pretty complex ways, or it's kind of a complex situation that our skeletal muscles are organized. Um, we have a lot of times muscles being nice and tubular in strength, uh, in shape, not strength, in shape, meaning that they're, you know, kind of a cylinder, um, long and skinny, about the same width all the way across. Not all muscles, but many of them are. If we open them up, like what we've done here, we can see that there are smaller cylindrical structures called fascicles. Okay? A fascicle is a bundle of what they call muscle fibers. Okay, so what I typically do in this situation is I let's see if I can do something. Create. Try the whiteboard. See if I can do it. A kind of flowchart. Okay, so bear with me. I'm trying this out. So at the top flow chart, we have what's called a whole muscle. And you know, this is just the, the entire muscle. Okay. And that whole muscle is then subdivided into structures called fascicles. Okay. Which a fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers. And then a fascicle is then subdivided into fibers, which is the fancy way to describe our muscle cells. Okay. So going back to my screen, if I can figure out how to. Uh, hang on, hang on. So, we have our whole muscle divided into bundles called fascicles. A fascicle is a grouping of muscle fibers, which a muscle fiber is just a fancy way to describe our muscle cells. Surrounding each muscle fiber 
which if we zoom in on a fascicle, we'll pull one of those out. So we're just zooming in basically at this portion of our figure right there. We see that there's a membrane that surrounds it called an endomycium. Okay. An endomycium is a thin sleeve of aerial or connective tissue surrounding each muscle fiber or muscle cell, as I've just mentioned. Okay. What we'll see is that inside of a muscle fiber are smaller cylindrical structures called myofibrils, and then inside of those are what we call filaments. Um, so um, later in this lecture, I'll um, continue my flow chart talking about myofibrils and filaments, but I'll wait to talk about that here after a bit. Okay. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these, um, but when I was a kid, there were these, you know, like little figurines that you could um, play with it, you know, let them kind of look like an Easter egg where you could open them up and there'd be a smaller version of that structure. You open that one up and there's a smaller one. You open that one up, there's a smaller one. You open that up. So it's kind of that situation here with skeletal muscle where you got a cylindrical muscle made up of smaller cylindrical muscles inside, or uh, muscle fascicles, excuse me. Inside of each fascicle are cylindrical fibers or cells. Inside of those are cylindrical myofibrils. So it's kind of crazy, but that's the way <laughs> we're built in our muscles. Now getting back to the epi, the peri, and the endomycium, um, they're all continuous with the connective tissue that attaches skeletal muscles to other structures, such as bone or another muscle. And this includes our tendons that we've been talking about which we should actually show here in our picture. Tendon is a fibrous cord, a dense, regular connective tissue attaching muscle to the periosteum of bones. Tendon sheaths are um, gonna enclose certain tendons in places like the wrist and ankle, where they function to decrease the friction placed on the tendon with a synovial membrane. We actually talked about these in our very last lecture when we talked about um, joints. We talked about um, tendons as well. Inner layer of a tendon sheath is known as the visceral layers attached to the inner surface of the tendon. Outer layers of parietal layers attached to the bone. Between them is a cavity where you find a film of synovial fluid, reducing the friction as the tendons slide back and forth. Okay, and we also have. Sorry, that's my four year old yelling in the background. What we call aponeuroses. An aponeurosis is basically just like a flattened tendon. So it's a broad, flat sheet of connective tissue, generally merging with the fibrous wrappings of a muscle. We'll see one of those major ones on top of our skull, <coughs> connecting a muscle on our forehead to a muscle in the back of our scalp. We'll talk about that in our next lecture. Um, skeletal muscles are well supplied with nerves and blood vessels because um, you know, muscles will not contract without oxygen. Um, to produce ATP and uh, glucose to, to, to make that ATP. So they need to be able to uh, bring those nutrients in by way of arteries. Um, we also produce a lot of waste in our muscles. So um, we are also going to have one or two or more veins accompanying the nerves that penetrate a skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscles do not, as we've talked about, contract without being coming excited. Um, they need to be excited by what we call somatic motor neurons. Uh, what we show actually in this picture down surrounding our muscle fiber in yellow is one of those somatic motor neurons. Somatic motor neuron is a neuron that has many branches. You can see some of those here. <coughs> that actually, this same motor neuron will probably be surrounding and innervating a lot of these other nearby muscle fibers and they would become excited at the same time and all would contract at the same time. The point where a uh, muscle fiber and a neuron are going to meet is called a neuromuscular junction, which should kind of make sense. Um, I won't really talk more about you know, the muscle um, motor units and that kind of stuff. I'll just kind of skip over that for now. Um, talk about blood capillaries, which are um, the points um, where um, nutrients are and wastes are exchanged. We actually see one here. Um, it's what this red squiggly line is. Um, we find them plentifully in our muscle tissues with each muscle fiber being in close contact with one or more. Um, and I've said it already, but muscle fibers use huge amounts of energy. 
which requires continuous supplies of oxygen and nutrients from our arteries. Um, muscle cells also, also give off large amounts of metabolic waste, which must be removed via veins. Um, and since our muscles change shape so much, uh, muscle capillaries must um, be long and winding to help accommodate for these changes in muscle length and shape. Okay, um, going through, I do want you to um, highlight some stuff in this kind of two-part picture. So I'll just kind of go down from the top here and um, tell you what to highlight. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'll start with the tendon. Highlight that. So anything I say, highlight. Perimysium, epimysium, fascicle, perimysium again, muscle fiber, muscle cell, myofibril, endomysium, <coughs> perimysium again. Then you can skip down to endomysium again, muscle fiber again, and then you can skip down to myofibril, filament <coughs> and I wouldn't worry about I would tell you if you would include this bracket or fascicle so you can keep your head straight on you know what you're looking at in this portion of the picture okay so here on this next page we're going to talk about the structures of a muscle fiber which I will give you a couple seconds here to write down <laughs> Okay, reading through. Most important components of a skeletal muscle are the actual muscle fibers, or once again, muscle cells themselves. The diameter of a mature skeletal muscle fiber will range from as small as 10 to as big as 100 microns. What's really cool, um, it's kind of surprising a lot of times, I imagine, to students to find out this, um, but the number of skeletal muscle fibers that we have in our muscles is set before we're born. Um, so if you were to look at you know, your, your biceps, your triceps, as a baby, as uh, and compare it to when you're as an adult, where you're at right now, um, you could count up the same number number of muscle fibers early in life and later in life. What you would not see is the that the the muscle is the same size. Obviously, muscles grow in size um, from when we're little babies to when we're adults. Um, so, for a muscle to grow in size, the muscle fibers must um, grow instead of increasing in muscle fiber cells. So, cells don't divide. They just grow in size, which is different than how most tissues grow. For example, bones, you know, we talked about the, the growth plate, epiphyseal plate. Um, that's where cell division goes um, or takes place in our bones to cause our bones to grow in length. Um, that's not what we see in our skeletal muscles. This ability of our muscle fibers to grow is called hypertrophy, um, stimulated by growth hormone and testosterone. Um, then produce uh, more testosterone in women, which typically explains why men have bigger muscles. Uh, people take growth hormone and testosterone synthetically to promote um, hypertrophy. A lot of bodybuilders and stuff like that, or people like that um, who want big butt muscles would do um, those types of things. The opposite of hypertrophy is atrophy, which is where the muscle fibers shrink in size, something that um, happens when you don't use muscle, um, when you don't stress it. You know, like um, if you ever have spent time in a cast, um, you know, you'll see once that cast comes off, that muscles or the, you know, that limb or whatever it has been, you know, in that cast, you haven't been able to use those muscles. So those muscles are really shrunk down. Fortunately, a little bit of time goes by, and, you know, you work on those muscles, they're going to come back without too much trouble. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's talk about the development of them. Um, from embryonic stem cells, we call these myoblasts, um, our skull muscle fibers form. What's actually really cool is these myoblasts um, embryonically fuse together, as you can watch here in this uh, illustration, eventually forming a singular cell with a whole bunch of nuclei. And that's what we said is one feature of skull muscle is that they're multinucleated. Okay. 
also playing a role in increasing the number of nuclei in a cell or in a muscle fiber are what we call satellite cells, which um, I mentioned <clears throat> just briefly right here in this um, paragraph. They increase the number of nuclei in mature muscle fibers, and that's the just of those. Now, um, a few weeks ago, we talked about things like um, the nucleus and the plasma membrane and the Golgi and, and the plus reticulum of cells, and we learned about what those things did, their structure. Well, muscle fibers, once again, fancy way to describe muscle cells, are going to contain those same exact organelles for the most part as what we see in other cells. Okay. One issue, though, that students um, are going to have to deal with um, is that some of those same organelles have a kind of different name. Um, for example, the plasma membrane of a muscle fiber gets a fancy name called its sarcolemma, which is what's shown here in blue. It surrounds the muscle fiber, holding you know the stuff inside um, and maintaining you know that barrier between the inside of the cell and outside of the cell. <coughs> like neurons, which we haven't talked about, um, it maintains what we call a resting membrane potential, which um, refers to the ability to basically respond to an action potential or nerve impulse, which will, once initiated, spread throughout the entirety of the sarcolemma, um, but also be carried internally to the center of the muscle fiber by way of these invaginations what we call transverse tubules, or T-tubes, which is what I usually call them. Transverse tubule, you can see, are in several places, carries an action potential to the center of the muscle fiber to trigger the release of calcium from what's called <clears throat> the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is just a fancy way to describe the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in our non-muscular cells. This is important in muscle fibers for its role in releasing calcium. Okay. The SR is kind of this gold sh um, shaded substance or um, finger like whatever you want, globby stuff in the center surrounding our myofibrils. And it stores and releases calcium when that action potential spreads inward. Now, we see that, if I move my picture over, right on both sides of a T-tube are fattened portions of the SR, which we call terminal cisterns. Okay, we label a terminal or a transverse tubule on both terminal cisterns that surround it a triad, because tri means three, and there are three things, two terminal cisterns, and a <clears throat> T-tube. Um, let's see, let's talk about the sarcoplasm. The sarcoplasm is just a fancy way to describe our cytoplasm. Um, it includes a substantial amount of stored glycogen, or, uh, um, which is our stored form of glucose. We um, store glycogen in organelles called glycosomes. We then can use that glycogen for the synthesis or making of ATP. There's also a substantial amount of a red colored protein in our sarcoplasm called myoglobin, which binds oxygen molecules so oxygen can be released for that ATP production process. Now, myoglobin, um, I always kind of say is like hemoglobin's cousin. You may have heard of hemoglobin before. Hemoglobin is a substance in our blood that stores and releases, or um, doesn't store, but it carries oxygen. Uh, it's the component of our red blood cells that actually turns our red blood cells and therefore our blood red. Myoglobin actually turns your muscles red. Um, and a lot of people didn't or don't know this, but when you eat like a, you know, a medium rare steak, you're not actually going to be, you know, seeing blood on the, on the plate, eating blood or anything like that. What you're just seeing is, you know, a water substance with myoglobin in it that's causing it to look red. So it looks like blood, but I promise you it's not. It's what we call myoglobin. <laughs> okay, let's talk about myofibril, something I've been mentioning already. And you can see our organelles, or excuse me, our cells have many of them. 
They can basically describe a myofibril as uh, the contractile organelle of a cell because they are the thread-like structures that have the contractile function, meaning that they are what contract, causing the muscle fiber to shorten. Uh, as you can see, they run, they run parallel to one another. Uh, we'll talk about their structural makeup more on the next page, where they're divided into what we call sarcomeres, how they're made up of thick and thin filaments, which are the structures that are actually found um, or are involved. I should say, with the contraction process. Um, it's this arrangement of the thick and thin filaments that are found within a myofibril that um, produce those prominent striations that we find in skeletal muscle fibers, um, and therefore skeletal muscle when you look at it under a microscope. We also see the same um, situation, myofibrils, circumeres, that kind of stuff, in cardiac muscle. Um, now, as far as the pictures go, I'm not going to worry about you knowing this one. I really didn't even talk about this one. Uh, but I do want you to know this one, and I would say pretty much anything would be fair game. So I will, you know, expect you to know it. It's an important image. Okay, I'm going to stop because my next video picks up with this um, slide. So. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put my whiteboard back up. Yeah, so cool. Still there. Um, I'm going to add to my little flow chart here from fibers. Down, I'm going to add what we call uh, myofibrils, which are the contractile organelles and then um, you will see in the next video I've handwritten it down I you know don't have access to a um, document camera at home like I do there so right, um, I do at work so we'll pick up talking about myofibrils sarcomeres filaments in the next video. Thanks.